Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We've got another great program for you tonight as we answer your gardening questions. If you'd like to get in touch with us, give us a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. If your question can wait a while, you can send us an email with pictures. That's to byf at unl.edu. We do love getting those emails, but you've got to tell us as much information about your problem as you can, including where you live. We won't sell your address to anybody. You can also stay in touch with us on all of our social media sites. That includes Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. So let's get started with samples. Jody Green, you bought the store. Yeah, so one of the questions I've been getting a lot lately are ants inside the kitchen coming in from outside or they don't know where they're coming from. And luckily, we do have a lot of options to do this ourselves. But a lot of times people are confused when they go to the store and you can see there are so many different kinds. Each of these baits have different active ingredients, so it's a different toxin. But the important thing to know is that not all baits are attractive to you know, all ants. So right now, the two ants are sugar feeding ants that are coming in. They are, people call them little black ants, so they're small, dark, and black. they're black. So, <laughs> but what you can do is smash them and sniff it. If it smells like blue cheese, for real, then that's the odorous house ant. And that is a voracious sugar eater. And one of the baits that we have here is a sugar bait. It's very good. You have to just make sure you put enough bait out there because the foragers or the workers out there looking for food, they're gonna bring it back to the nest. So if you put that out there, it's supposed to be attractive and it's supposed to be like a party for them, but you have to refrain from killing them in a different way. So you don't wanna spray and you don't wanna smash them. But you can see there's a lot of different choices. It's important to know if you do find that you have a carpenter ant, that the not all baits are going to work for that. And the label will say which ants it is good for. And it will say not for carpenter ants. So the one here, it's an outdoor. There's a couple outdoor. There's liquid. And we also have tamper-proof or child-resistant bait. But you want to put it as close to the trail that you see them or the ant. So don't put them on your counter. Put them closest to the door. If you find a hole, plug that up and bait on the outside. Perfect, and um, read the label. Yeah, so if anyone needs any bait, let me know. They're also effective <laughs> for Great Dane baiting. Great Dane baiting. Oh, they love it. No, non <laughs> great. Uh, so. All right, so um, Bill, on that note, what is yeah. your sample? <laughs> so, uh, first thing I want to say uh, hello to some of the friends I met from Hupper this last week. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm terrible at that name. Um, and uh, I had a great time this weekend meeting fans, so I always appreciate seeing you guys uh, out and about. Uh, but today I want to talk about starter fertilizer because uh, we had a question about starter fertilizer last year. And I brought a bag of Scott starter fertilizer um, because it's pretty unique relative to the other starter fertilizers and it has the herbicide tenacity or mesotrione in it. And so the benefit of this is it helps to keep those summer annuals down and even can help to kill the dandelions that are there. So a lot of times we say don't seed in the springtime. And the main reason is because it gets so hot and those weeds come and they compete with the, uh, the developing seedlings. And so by including the tenacity with this Scott starter fertilizer, we put it down, it doesn't hurt the grass at all. And then it, it helps to suppress those, uh, those, those uh, seedlings, or those uh, weed seeds that are coming up. So you can tell if you got it, just look down at the bottom. Usually it's in fine print and you'll see it says uh, mesotrione on there. That's the active ingredient of tenacity. And it's important to make sure that when you're applying it, you are sticking to the label because you have a herbicide in with this. So you don't wanna just willy nilly throw it everywhere. So measure out your yard, figure out is it a thousand square feet? And we know this bag is 5,000 square foot of coverage. So you should be using about about one fifth of this bag. And if you don't want to calibrate your spreader because it's too complicated or hard, there's numbers on the back, but if you don't have a spreader that has numbers that match, one, buy a new spreader that does match, seriously, <laughs> or go to a really low setting and then you can just keep going over your yard over and over and over until the amount that you want to apply is gone. I'm lazy, I take that approach and it works just fine, so. Perfect, and we have N, P, and K. N, P, and K, yeah, so P is the main thing, it's the second number, so nitrogen is the main fertilizer we're talking about, and then phosphorus is the second number, potassium K is the last number. Don't really worry about potassium too much, but phosphorus, we always need to apply phosphorus when we seed because uh, 
even if it's high in the soil, it's generally not high enough for those seedlings. All right, thank you, Bill. Yep. Okay, Kyle, a little urnian action for us. Yeah, so it's a little bit early for many of the diseases to be showing up, so I brought some stuff that looks like a disease. Um, but these are some onions that I had pulled up, and you can notice that all the tips are burning on, on these onions, and that is just a physiological disorder. Um, it can look like can look like some different fungal pathogens that may come in, but if I were to guess, this was probably caused by the uh, ultra low temperatures that we had about a week and a half ago. The t onions like cooler temperatures. They don't really like it when it gets down underneath 20 degrees. So that will, uh, will end up burning some of these tips. And as the season goes on and as the, as the onions start to produce more bulbs, you'll wanna continue to watch these plants that do have some of the, uh, the dead tissue at, on their tips because that could be an, become an infection court for some different fungal pathogens. So whether it's Botrytis or Fusarium, but now that these, these leaves are dead, the fungus is able to enter them more easily to a, continue to attack the plant. So are you better off just to just scissor those off or is that even worse? Um, I would just leave them and, and keep an eye on them throughout the summer. All right, thank you, Kyle. Elizabeth, not a good specimen. Well, it depends on your point of view. Um, uh, sadly, this specimen is not gonna come back to life. What it was is I had somebody call, they had some spruce, it was really sick. They were wondering if they could, um, it was possibly dead and it is indeed dead because all the needles are brown on it. And so we were trying to figure out, was it environmental, was it disease, what exactly were we talking about with this? And then so I told the gentleman, I said, why don't you go ahead and, and pull it up because he bought this at an auction, um, not from a nursery and, and not from any reputable supplier. He bought them at an auction um, just to check the root ball. So he pulled it up and we take a look at the root ball. So ideally with trees, we want to plant them with the flare roots down here, kind of at or near grade, because that's ideally what we want to do with that. So if we were to take a look, we want to plant it down here. This tree was planted up to here in the dirt, which is a good eight inches deeper than what it should be. And what that means is this tree was dead when it got planted. Um, these spruce have a really shallow root system, and so when we plant them a little deep, it's going to put some extra roots on, which is what this guy did. It was just trying to put some more roots on up near the surface. When it gets planted way too deep, there's nothing that we can do. That tree is going to suffocate because those roots are just planted way too deep. There's not enough air exchange in there. Um, so we need to make sure, for one, that we buy quality nursery stock when we do this. We get them from a reputable supplier, for one, and for two, we need to make sure that we are checking where those roots are at um, in that container and in that pot to make sure that we put them at the right spot and at the right grade. Um, if we plant them too deep, like I said, it's just gonna smother those roots and that tree's gonna have a hard go. So sadly, no matter how much he watered this little tree, it uh, wasn't gonna do a whole lot of good because it was already planted too deep. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Besides, it's easier to dig a shallower hole. It is, and it's a little tree. <laughs> All right, Jody, you get the first picture question. Okay. Um, this is actually a viewer, obviously did not see this insect now, but uh, she thought it was on bindweed, and we've determined this is honey vine milkweed. Mm -hmm. She wants to know what this is. She thought it was maybe a, a monarch, and then is she right, and how she's, do you attract more of them? Yeah, she's absolutely right, and honey vine milkweed kind of grows as a weed. Most people want to rip it out. Um, I had it growing over a fence, wild, and it pretty much choked out a lot of other things, but it really attracts pollinators of all sorts, and it does, it is a milkweed plant, so uh, the larvae of the monarch butterfly, so those caterpillars will feed on that, those heart-shaped leaves, and um, if they can make it through their stages of life and pupate and become butterflies, we'll see them probably from June until like the middle of October. So what you can do to attract more, plant more flowers, um, but that milkweed is good for the, for the caterpillar stage. So if you can keep that around, you keep, uh, or you can cut a piece and feed it and raise them. Um, it's a little more work, but I mean, we love the butterflies, right? <laughs> I'm gonna let mine eat all by themselves on my honey vine yeah, all the way I leave my it. shrubs. <laughs> Perfect, thanks, Jody. All right, Bill. Yep. I think you know who sent this picture in. <clears throat> Maybe. And you know who did this damage to the lawn. I so know two of them. <laughs> so let's talk about dog spots in the lawn, yes. shall we? So this is my backyard. I think it's a pretty good example of dog spot. I have two large dogs and the grass is greening up. It's south facing, so we do get a little bit of heat in our backyard. So we're having some 
some green grass there. And uh, I'm, well, I had a bluegrass lawn. I've been overseeding with tall fescue, and tall fescue is a bunch type grass. And so one of the problems with that is when the dogs do kill the grass over the winter and they don't doesn't green up, um, I want to want to get in there and seed it. And so this is a really second best time to do it is in the spring. Again, using that starter fertilizer I just talked about with the mesotrione. Um, but making sure we get good seed to soil contact, so rough up the dead tissue. If you can get that seed in there and you can kind of work it into the soil any way possible, even like a, a lawn, um, uh, what's that called, vertical like power rake, you know, it seems really aggressive, but actually has a really good job of pushing that seed in. Um, that's going to really help, and then hopefully we'll get a little bit of rain, and hopefully it doesn't get too hot. If it gets too hot really quick this year, then we're going to have some problems with our seedings. If it stays cool and slowly heats up, which probably won't happen, then, uh, then the, the seedlings can really come mature properly. But uh, get that seed in the ground now so we can have the longest period of time before that intense heat uh, uh, comes this summer. Or you actually train your dogs to go pee someplace else. I mean, it's possible, but they're not very intelligent. <laughs> So. <laughs> yours might not be. Oh well, my God, maybe yours are, but. <laughs> All right, Kyle, uh, this is a picture from Scott's Bluff. We always love to have things on from other parts of the state. Unfortunately, it is uh, red barren crab apples, a couple years old, uh, started declining pretty quickly. And uh, a couple of issues associated both with this picture, and then you actually have a second mm -hmm. question later. So yeah. what's going on here? Well, here we have a pretty severe canker issue um, on this on this crab apple, and I'm not entirely sure if this is the same the same trunk and just two different sides of it that we're looking at. Um, but if you look at this picture here, you can really see the outline of the canker where the, um, where it's the light colored bark it becomes darker, and there's just that black margin that's in the canker, and that black margin is pretty typical of Phytophthora um, collar rot. And then as the, as the disease progresses, it will eventually um, form, a, form a, a crack, crack in, the, in the bark and will form callus tissue, in which we can see on the other picture there, where it started to, started to try to heal itself, but it still has a fair amount, of, fair amount of exposed tissue on the inside of the trunk. As far as control, there's not a whole lot that can be done for it at this point. Really just uh, kind of baby the tree a little bit if, it, if you are noticing that it's having a lot of troubles leafing out on one side, then maybe you even want to, uh, want to think about replacing that tree. All right, yeah, the trunk cankers are always... They're rough. It's, you can uh, prune out the limbs, but you can't really prune out a trunk, unfortunately. <laughs> you can with the chainsaw. That's true. <laughs> Speaking of pruning, Elizabeth, your first picture. Uh, this is a viewer who didn't get the tie down, the nylon tie down off a three-year-old maple. A tree trunk grew over it. Now the tie is gone, but the trunk is like this. She does say it's grown nicely and does have some new buds. What are we thinking here? Unfortunately, with this type of a situation, it's just gonna be weight. Um, what happens is all the nutrient movement happens right behind the bark in the cambium tissue. So when we have something that's growing into that tree, um, what it's doing is like it's kinking a hose. And so that's why that tree was growing over the top of it is it was restricted in that one spot. And what's gonna happen is on that, is it a maple? It's gonna have a weak point on that trunk. So eventually you could see where that tree with time as it gets bigger, if, we, if that issue stays there, it's gonna be a weak point and it has the potential to snap off. So that's why we recommend don't leave those tree ties on for more than at least one season. And we try to use things that um, won't grow into the tree. So there's that rubber hose, and we want that top to move around to get that reflex tissue, if at all possible. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, that's too bad because that looked like that was probably was a pretty good tree. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, a lot of people have problems with insect pests, and that's during the growing season. But what happens to those pests when the weather gets cold? How do they all come back in in the spring? Here's Jonathan Larson, our entomologist, to tell us more. This time of year I get a lot of questions. Phil, is the grass dead? And the answer is no, it just went dormant. This process all started last fall in October. Um, one of the ways a plant goes dormant is it tries to get some of the water out of its leaves because water in the plants can freeze, like it freezes in your pipes, and it can kill the plant. So the plant dehydrates, and then depending on the winter, it will have two different colors. If we have a winter like this, 
where we had a lot of uh, snowfall, maybe the grass is a little bit more green color because the snow actually protects it. It insulates it from the really cold temperatures, but it also insulates it from the sun. The sun actually comes and it bleaches out all the leaves, just like a, the, the sun would bleach paint off the side of a building. Then you have years where it's wide open, where you have desiccation, it's windy, there's not a lot of snow cover, there's not much precip precipitation. And in that case, the leaves can die back all the way to the crown, the growing point of the plant. And so in years where we get a fair amount of snow, once the warm weather resumes, the grass leaves can kind of just start to resume normal growth. In those drier years, like in 2014, it takes a little bit longer for that grass to come out of dormancy because it's got to regrow all those leaves that were killed during the desiccation. It's important to know though that our grass when it looks like this is in the same state that it would be in the summer if you had drought. You wouldn't want to go out and start uh, beating it up with aeration and cultivation and a lot of traffic in the middle of a drought in summer. But a lot of people will run out to golf courses or they'll go to their lawn and they'll start cultivating it in the end of winter when it's equally as stressed out. So if we're thinking about you know, managing our grass as it's starting to break dormancy, all we can really do is be patient, make sure we have heat and moisture, which Mother Nature is gonna give us. And when that happens, the grass will resume when it's ready to resume growth. So there's not a lot we wanna to do to push that along. So what should we be doing this time of year? One thing is just to go out, pick out extra debris. If you have pets, any pet waste, remove that so it's not going to be washed into the, into the street or into a river during a rainfall event. And uh, make sure your mower is ready. Is it sharp? If you change the oil, if you change the filter, I know I have to do it this year. So make sure we have those things ready. When the grass starts to then resume growth, get some mowings on it. And then once it's green and growing, we can start to do things like dethatching or aeration. And, and we can put our kids back on the lawn so that uh, it is ready to handle that extra wear. So that's kind of the life cycle of, of what the grass is doing over the course of the winter in Nebraska. That looked a lot more like lawn than insects. So since everybody likes the lush green lawn as soon as possible, but we are too early to start really managing our turf very much, as Bill said. A little patience goes a long way, especially since we have what I heard was a lot of snow predicted for a little bit yeah. later in the week. A lot of patience this spring, right? <laughs> a lot of patience mm -hmm. this spring. Mm -hmm. All right, Jody, you get the next picture. Um, this is actually from one of our great people on campus, Red Twig Dogwood. Uh, she's seen it on the straight species, not on a lot of the newer cultivars, which do have thinner twigs. But first she sees this kind of in the upper canopy of the twigs, and then she she's, has split it open. And she sees this, this humongo <laughs> um, <laughs> creature inside. So what are we looking at? So and what juicy. Can, <laughs> <laughs> what can be done about it? That is the larval stage of a dogwood twig borer, which is a beetle. Um, the beetles are actually these orange and black beetles, tiny, kind of cute. These are not as cute, but it will make the dogwoods look really dry and wilty. Some of the uh, leaves will look dead. Uh, but yes, you cut them open because, or to see the twig, and like they're eating the inside all the way down to the root. And sometimes you'll see the round holes where they're kicking out their frass or poop. And uh, so to get rid of that, you would want to uh, prune. After the wilting, but before the adults emerge and they will pupate in the twig and come out around June, so. So what she's been doing is slicing the twig open. That will work and, too. And cutting the bores in half. Yeah. I guess that works too. Seems violent. It's, it's a non-chemical <laughs> pest. Yes, it is, mechanical control. Yes. All right, Bill, yep. uh, we have a weed question for you because you love weed questions. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is uh, of course, what is this? It's hembit. Yes, it is. And what do we do about it, A, either this time of year or in the fall? So this is a winter annual, which means it starts to germinate and grow in the fall. And... Um, so it may not may, may be hard to see too in the fall. It's there, it's growing, it's not really large. And then once the winter is over, they start to grow really big and they flower. And so they're very obvious right now, this purple kind of color flower, right? So it, it like stands out. Um, since it's a winter annual, you know, we can let mother nature take its course and it will die when the heat's um, gone. This weed really likes thin grass. 
So if your lawn is thin, this is a good indication that maybe you're a little lean on fertilizer, you have compacted soil, you're a little, maybe you should do a little bit of seeding. Uh, you know, this time of year before it gets too hot outside, to try to dense, get a, a denser lawn. Um, if you have a, a problem with that and history of that, a pre-emergence herbicide actually around Labor Day will help control these winter annuals. And so maybe getting on that kind of a program will help. If you really want to spray it out now, anything with the 2,4-D type products is very uh, effective on this particular weed. All right. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. Kyle, second picture from Scott's Bluff. Oof. Same crab apples. Poor so crab apples. They, they dug some of these up, and, and you can see sort of this odd root system with some nodules. Mm -hmm. And then the close-up is all of these nodules. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and she least, thinks it's crown gall, but what? <laughs> yeah, so at least beautiful to a pathologist, I yeah. should say. Um, yeah, I, I agree that that does look like crown gall to me. Um, it's caused by a bacterial pathogen, agrobacterium. It's, this, this pathogen can infect almost every woody plant that's out there. Um, there's over 150 genera that can be affected by, by crown gall, and crab apples are definitely one of them. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of good controls for, uh, for crown gall. It is, it's, it's uh, more or less ubiquitous in the soil, and so if you would try to transplant, anything you would do that moves the soil will also move the, move the crown gall. So, can't just replant those somewhere else because then you'll be moving that bacteria. Now there are a couple of biological products that are out there right now. Um, one is actually a, it's a non-pathogenic strain of the agrobacterium, and that's shown to be fairly effective. Basically, it just outcompetes the the crown gall bacteria. Um, otherwise, you know, crown gall does not typically kill established trees, and so if the if they are somewhat established. Just give them a little bit of extra care. Um, keep an eye on them. Make sure that the, uh, you're doing proper uh, fertilizer program, proper moisture, and things like that. And with any luck, they will um, continue to thrive for a couple of years. <laughs> Good. A couple is better than none. Yes. My guess is they want more than that. So we'll see. It'll be fun to see a follow-up picture on that <laughs> yeah. one. All right, Elizabeth. Um, this is a viewer who would like to know how to prune amethyst falls wisteria. And what she's actually wanting to do is train it up a couple of these old ladders. It's kind of a neat concept to hide those garbage cans. It is a really fun concept. My only concern is I could see those ladders starting to fall apart before the wisteria gives up because um, the wisteria is going to be a really hardy uh, vine for them. But when it comes to that amethyst falls, right now you want to be pruning and you're going to prune it hard. You want to prune it back to three to five buds on each one of those little branches. Um, so it's going to look kind of bare, but it's going to be fine and it's going to come right out of it and it's going to bloom fine this later spring. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we have a handful of plants sprouting in our little hoop house out in the garden, but most of the action is still going on inside the greenhouse. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we wanted to show you what we've been doing all winter long. We actually started last October, right before all those cold freezes started in the garden. We cut back some of the favorite annuals that we had, put them on the mist bench, and got some roots going. We babied them all winter long, started more cuttings from them in January and February. And now look at what we have. Coleus, irisene, all these really cool annual flowers are gonna add to our containers this summer. In about late February, 1st of March, we started some of those longer per, uh, annuals that we have to plant. So we started some of the ornamental peppers. We started some begonias. Uh, we actually started some pansies also so we can have a little bit of color in our garden early in the season in the containers. Last week, we probably planted about 10 more different kinds of tomatoes and peppers. So we're really looking forward to that. As you can see, they're sitting on the heat mats, ready to burst through the soil. And then we'll pot them up, make the, put them into bigger containers. We're gonna take care of them until about the 1st of May. And we're gonna start moving them outside and hardening them off to put them in the backyard farmer garden for everybody to check out. Thanks, Terry. It looks like it'll be another fun adventure out in our garden. Always fun to see what grows and doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jody, this is a question from an Omaha viewer. 
40-year-old linden in the backyard. Japanese beetles have been defoliating it. They've been using grub uh, takes care of the insects in the lawn, doesn't do anything for the tree. So they're wondering what should they do here? Any other options? Or well, is the tree going to croak? What okay, do, so what the tree have? is not going to die. We'll say that first. So the Japanese beetles will skeletonize the, tr the, the leaves and it will look very sad. I'm sorry about your tree and I'm sorry about a lot of the trees in Omaha that have gone through that last year. We are probably going to brace ourselves for this again. There are some arborists that may have some things that they can treat with, but um, I think it's better to kind of deal with the, the problem and just, I guess, deal with the nastiness. Because over time, with most uh, invasive species, it will moderate and it won't be as drastic. And so we won't lose the tree. And so you don't have to worry about that. But I would uh, err against uh, um, a chemical treatment. Right. So just look the other direction. Yes. Well, lindens are, you know, they flower and they're very attractive to pollinators and bees. Right. And so we really don't have a systemic that you can apply to lindens. It's against the law. Okay. Thanks, Jody. All right, Bill. Yep. When should we put down the pre-emerge fertilizer this spring? This is Fremont, Lincoln, Omaha. Take this, your city. Everybody's wanting to know. The entire state of Nebraska right now right. does not need a pre-emergence herbicide if you're doing it yourself. If you have a lawn company, they may be making applications, and they may be doing it for two reasons. One, they may be doing a split application, and so they have flexibility because they're going to do a little bit now and a little bit later. Um, another reason that they might be doing it is they might have a thousand lawns I have to try to treat. And so, but if you're doing your own lawn, then I would wait. Um, the soils are still very colder in the 40s. The crabgrass isn't going to really germinate until well, to at least 60. So we say 55 degrees for an average of a couple days to almost a week. And so we're probably looking at May with this type of season. The Climate Prediction Center is not very optimistic that we're going to be warm for the next couple of weeks. So I'm guessing a May application is probably when we're going to see that pre-app going out. All right. Thank you, Bill. Okay, Kyle. This is a Nebraska City viewer that had brown rot in their peaches last year. Okay. Wonders if is there anything they can do to prevent that this year? Yeah. So one of the great ways to help control brown rot in peaches is to do some pruning when the tree is dormant, and so that ideally should have been done a couple of months ago. Um, it, right now, it's going to be a little bit late to do to do too much pruning on that and you may, you may end up damaging the tree if you do. But luckily there are some, um, some fungicides that can, can be sprayed that can work fairly well to control brown rot. Um, unfortunately, you'll want to do, um, you want to control or you want to spray those fungicides on a fairly regular schedule once the, really once the flowers are starting to be produced on the tree and then really throughout, uh, throughout fruit set is how long you'll apply the fungicide. All right, so it's a, it's a labor of love. For it's a labor of love. And anytime you see any of those mummies, um, any of the, the diseased fruit, just try to uh, get rid of them as soon as you can. Sanitation plays a big role in brown rot, too. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. All right, Elizabeth, uh, speaking of fruit, we have a viewer from, <laughs> not you, I do that once every year. <laughs> All right, this is an Omaha viewer who wants to know about planting bare root peach and apple trees, north facing front yard this spring. Uh, will they be a year closer, probably a growing season, to producing fruit if they do that now rather than plant in the fall? So plant bare root now, plant them in the fall. With the bare root trees, it, you're going to have more selection and a lot more selection if you do, do it in the spring. If you wait till fall, you might or might not have some. They might or might not have the cultivars that you want. So your best bet is to go ahead and plant them this fall. Um, then you're going to have to baby them and make sure that they have plenty of water throughout the summer and the growing season, especially if we're going to be dry like we could be this summer. Um, are they truly going to be a year ahead? They're going to be a year more in the ground. Um, peaches are going to take two to three years before they start to produce fruit. On average, a useful lifespan of a peach in a commercial setting is eight years. So enjoy it while you got it um, with that peach tree. And plant in the spring, not the fall. Plant in the spring, that's right. <laughs> All right. We will start the lightning round. Ready, Elizabeth? I'm ready. We have a viewer who wants to add manure to their garden, and where can they get it? 
Um, you can buy purchased manure. We want to make sure if we're applying it to the vegetable garden, we do it 90 days prior to harvest, and in some instances, and 120 days prior to harvest when the edible portion comes in contact with the soil. So we might be out of that time frame for you. Excellent. When should a Lincoln viewer prune their Korean spice viburnum? After blooming, because it's the best smelling viburnum out there. <laughs> we have a viewer who has a, a 25 foot canopy maple and they want to build a wall around it and then fill with soil. Good idea, bad idea? Nope, do not advise again for, no. <laughs> <laughs> is it too early to see green in the roses or is it rosy toasty? I, it's a little early yet. Um, usually we don't want to even prune them or think about pruning them until we get into May. All right, would an orange glory butterfly bush be a good choice for the south side of a house in Utan? You bet. <laughs> Very cute answer, Elizabeth. <laughs> I get bonus points for that one. Come on now. <laughs> All right, Kyle, you ready? I su and I suppose. <laughs> How does he follow that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Will botrytis overwinter in a strawberry bed? Um, it will overwinter on the dead leaves and the t any uh, any tissue that you leave. So if you do a good job of sanitation at the end of the season, you should be able to get rid of most of the botrytis. All right. Um, so the canker that shows up in red twig dogwood, can you ever stop pruning it? Or is if you have canker in the red twig, will you always have canker in red twig? Uh, typically, if you have the canker in a red twig, you will always have cankers in the red twig. The fungus or bacteria that's causing the canker will continue to, um, to spread throughout the tree. And as soon as you prune one of those cankers out, another one will start to form. Nice, okay. We have a Hebron viewer who had brown mush in the centers of their, of their Yukon gold potatoes last year. Okay. What? Uh, sounds just like a soft rot of some sort, uh, possibly a bacterial or fungal pathogen. I would guess bacterial. I'd toss those out. Okay. We have a crumbly raspberries last year. Is that some sort of a disease in raspberries? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Learning from Elizabeth. That's right. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and we'll get that question later again, yeah. no doubt. Okay, Bill, you ready? Yes. We have an Omaha viewer who wants to know how what he describes as the invading horde, in other words, zoysia, from crossing the property line. Um, there is a one product called Pylex. Beside from that, there's not much you can really do. All right. We have a Bertrand viewer who wants to know about a good fertilizer formula for an older lawn. Yeah, that's a good question. If your lawn is older, and then you probably only need nitrogen, so just the first number. All right, what is your first choice for covering seed in a newly seeded lawn area? I think, make, first of all, make sure it's clean. We tested some different mulch materials from, and there's a lot of weed seed in there. And so generally some of the manufacturer products are a little better because there's not weed seed there or just get some certified mulch material that might have annual grasses like barley in there that you're gonna mow off anyway. So make sure it's clean. All right. Um, we have a viewer who had sod go down before that 10 degree temperature drop and it was not watered. Is there any hope? It's going to be hard to say. I have some dead grass all around campus too. And, um, it, you just have to watch for the green up. If it doesn't green up, you have to resod, unfortunately. All right. Thank you. Nice job. Ready, Jody? Okay. <laughs> Optimistic. <laughs> so we, we have a, a person who would like to get some pollinators and they want to know if they can actually buy solitary bees or should they just buy one of those bee hotels? Well, you can buy bees, uh, but you, uh, if you put in a solitary bee hotel and have the nesting tubes or blocks with holes, that's great too, but you just really need to plant some flowers. Okay, perfect. So we have a, a, a young child found some bird feathers and brought them into the house. Will they have lice on them? Probably not. Okay, good. Do you recommend <laughs> malathion for spider mite control on outdoor plants? No. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> How far west uh, are we seeing emerald ash borer? This is a Seward viewer. Why okay. don't you know if it's that so far? So the Greenwood is still the, the farthest west we've seen it, so right. Cass County. Okay. Uh, a table rock viewer wants to know what termites look like right now. Uh, well, uh, it depends what cast you're seeing. If you're seeing anything with wings, it could be termites if it's swarming. But usually when you're doing a renovation, you open a wall and you see them, they look kind of like white. 
soft bodied. They they don't they'll dry up if they're in the air, so you won't even see them, or if they're you know out in the open. So they're weird little bitty things. So they either look like ants or they look like rice <laughs> or lice. Right. I like I used to like rice. I used to like rice. <laughs> the women won. There you go. Okay, Elizabeth, what do we have for Plants of the Week? And I do want you to give the scientific name. Uh, yeah, not going to happen. Because <laughs> it's like five syllables long. <laughs> uh, so for the first one in front, uh, the common name is winter fat. Um, that's as close as I'm going to get. The scientific name starts with a K and a lot of other uh, in it. Uh, winter fat is one of the fun ones because um, it's excellent for wildlife. Different animals like to browse it. It has a really deep fibrous root system on it. And it's really, um, it can handle all sorts of soils. It, it really doesn't like the wet or the acidic soils, but you know, out in Grand Island where we have a little bit more alkaline soils, we could do um, just well with that one. Um, the other one that we have is the prairie willow. And it's really cool because anything in that willow family makes these fuzzy little buds and they're just so soft. Um, but this one gets about four to six feet. Um, it'll do well in, in the sandy soil and disturbed soils. Really likes that full sun. And again, it can handle our alkaline soils that we kind of have around the Grand Island area. Um, and it'll do really well in those well-drained soils. It does tend to sucker, so that's something to keep in mind with that. The cool part about both of these plants is they're dioecious, which means they have boy and girl plants. So um, that's your fun fact for the day. <laughs> and, they're, and they're both silver and they're shrubby and they're native. That's and, so fluffy. And, so uh, nice. and we want to say thanks to Scott's Bluff again for the winter fat, which has journeyed all the way across the state in the back of Terry's truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, Jody, you get the next picture question. Um, and this one is some, somebody found this in their mm -hmm. house and it was already dead, but they're wondering what it is. How did it get in and is it a pest or is it just okay. a curiosity? So this is a brown marmorated stink bug. It is a pest. It's actually an agricultural pest of specialty crops, fruit, vegetables, and nuts. Uh, for us in Omaha and Lincoln, it is an overwintering pest. So it comes in in the fall, like some of the other overwintering pests, to, to survive, right? And so there's not much you can do about it except vacuum them up. They will, they're, they're stink bugs, so they do stink. We do have native stink bugs, but they overwinter outside. Um, I don't know if I answered the question. You did, yeah. Okay. What it is and what to do about <laughs> okay. it. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, Bill, uh, th this is a viewer who has had this plant growing in, the, in his bee balm bee in his garden. Mm -hmm. He says it gets a couple feet tall, has a kind of this nasty seed head, triangular cross section in the, in the stems, um, wonders what exactly. And, and so this is a sedge. Mm -hmm. um, Kim has informed me it is an ornamental sedge, mm -hmm. as opposed to the yellow nut sedge that I'm more familiar with in the lawn. But for all the sedges, you'll know they're not grasses because of that triangular stem. So if you're ever trying to identify a grass, one of the first things you do is you grab the, the grass and you run it through your fingers. Grasses will roll or will feel like, a, like a, you're flipping a, a um, tongue depressor between your hands. The sedges will be triangular, so you'll know it's a sedge. So then any of the things that you would use to control grass, like grass be gone, is not gonna work on these. So you'd have to use something like um, uh, sedge hammer or sedge ender is another one. Um, you, if it's like something like this, you could try to dig it up. You have to make sure you dig it up deep enough because there's these little nutlets in the ground, they're little tubers that hold energy. And so if you just cut it and pull it out and you don't get all the nutlets out, then it's going to just come right back. So those are kind of your options. And when you're controlling sedges in the garden or sedges in your lawn, getting them when they're small is the most important. And it might take sequential applications of those herbicides to really become effective. All right. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. So this one, Kyle, mm -hmm. this viewer sent this picture of a cedar, and I think our viewers can probably see all those little orange deals all over the tips of the branches. Yeah, those are uh, look to me like a lot of uh, just male cones, mm -hmm. and so really nothing, nothing to worry about. Most people are more familiar with the female cones on cedars, so the, the more woody um, cones that you're used to. The male cones are going to be much more herbaceous, and that's where the pollen actually comes from. And it is not it's, cedar apple rust. It, it, is, it is not cedar apple rust, no, but there may be a couple of galls on that tree. Luckily, our uh, weather has not been conducive to those galls popping yet. So. 
All right. One way to know is you tap the branch, you see yellow stuff, then there are the male cones, and that's all the pollen that everybody enjoys. Yes. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Kyle. Elizabeth, uh, this is a pruning question. So this is a viewer that has a maple. Um, Planted from bare root about three years ago. It's been growing great. Wonders about pruning the lower branches off and whether they will, if, if not, will they eventually be a weak point on the tree? Based on the, the branching angle of those two lower branches, I would recommend that you remove them. Now, because the tree is so small, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to subordinate them, which means cut back a portion of them, so that way that tree puts most of its energy <coughs> back into that central leader. Um, we only want to remove about one-third of the canopy at any point in time, so you want to subordinate, subordinate them this year, lead, let it grow, and then take them off the rest of the way next year. Because of the way their branching angle is, they're going to be a problem. And also, tree branches are always going to maintain and stay at the same height. And so it's not like they're going to grow up as a tree grows up. So they look pretty low to the ground, and it looks like they're going to be a mowing hazard potentially at some point in time. Um, or you're just really not going to enjoy mowing underneath those branches. But um, I'd also take a look at the central leader, too, inside the canopy. I think there were some issues in that one, too. So take a look. You want one strong central leader for as long as possible and you want to make sure we don't have too of an acute of branching angle on those branches. Excellent. Good climbing tree if he leaves those branches yeah. on. <laughs> All right, so now we can hear from Jonathan. People have issues with those inside insect pest friends during the growing season and the, and the outside pests, but what happens to them when the weather gets cold and how do they all come back during the spring? So here's Jonathan to tell us all about those bugs. I get a lot of questions every year about how do insects survive the winter? We had a particularly cold winter this year and people always are very hopeful that a lot of the pests and some of the bugs that they don't like will be killed by those cold snaps. And the truth is that that's not gonna happen most of the, most of the time. Insects have a lot of strategies to survive the winter, to survive those cold periods. Some insects, like our favorites, the monarchs or the painted lady butterflies, which we saw a lot of last year, they can actually migrate. They use successive generations to escape cold areas like Nebraska and move into warmer areas like Mexico. And so they actually avoid those cold temperatures. That's one strategy, one really efficient strategy, but some insects, they can't pull that off. And so they have to live where it's cold and they either are going to try and avoid being frozen or they're going to be able to tolerate those freezing temperatures. In order to tolerate freezing, you usually have an antifreeze inside of your body as an insect. Just like the antifreezes that we put into our cars, they have the same chemicals in them that help them to stop ice crystals from forming in their body. This helps them to stop being frozen and keeps them safe and alive throughout the winter. That's a minority of insects though. Most insects fall into the freeze avoidance category, where they try to find some spot around them where they can get away from the cold. Some insects do this as an adult. In this bag here, we have a brown marmorated stink bug. Brown marmorated stink bugs are an invasive species that are a problem in gardens. They're kind of relatively new to the Nebraska area, but when they feed on those plants, they can cause damage. One of the bigger issues we see with them is in the fall, they invade our home in order to try and escape and avoid those freezing temperatures. They think our houses and our buildings are just big, tall, warm trees that they can hide out in. So they crawl inside and become a problem. We also see this with multicolored Asian lady beetle and things like box elder bugs and a few others. So when we have that happen, we have to vacuum them up or spray them down with soapy water and get rid of them. But that's one way of doing it. Other insects are going to avoid freezing by overwintering as an egg. One example of that would be a bagworm. Inside of these bags, the female bagworm will have laid her eggs and they're protected inside the bag. The egg is protected by its own anti-freezing chemicals and they overwinter in that way so that they don't get frozen. Others are gonna do it as a larva. Everybody has been talking about the Japanese beetle for the last year and a half or so. The Japanese beetle as a larva is a white grub and turf like what's all around me here. They feed on the roots of grass and can be problematic during the summer and the fall, but during the winter, they move below the frost line in the soil and they wait out those cold temperatures. When it starts to warm up in the spring, they can feel that and they move closer to the surface and get ready to emerge. Insects are able to feel temperature changes 
They're also able to notice that the days are getting longer rather than the shorter winter days. And so that helps them to know when to come out and when they can reactivate their life cycles or hatch. And then that helps them to start new populations the next year. So it was cold, you were miserable, and it's not gonna help you get rid of any pests. I'm sorry to tell you. Well, fortunately, we will not have to worry about this problem for a little while, and it's really a little early also to start thinking about controlling insects, except for those ones that trot into the house. It's my Our, specialty. Your <laughs> specialty. All right, Jody. well, this is maybe not an insect, oh. but this is a tree has several of these in random places. He wonders what this is exactly, and we're looking at this trying to figure it out. What do we think here? So at first we didn't know what it was because usually insects will leave something, webbing or poop. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see any frass and I don't see any webbing from these pictures. Um, it would be really great to see a sample um, because it looks like those needles are all fused together. Mm -hmm. um, but then a friend said that it looks like a balsam. Mm -hmm. So there is a balsam twig aphid and sometimes the honeydew from the aphids will make them stick together. Mm -hmm. And one of the symptoms of the aphids are that the new growth will look deformed. So it could be that, but again, it would be really good to see a sample. Good, and he said those showed up last year in kind of the Bellevue area. So maybe he can do a sample this year. Okay. All right, Bill, mm -hmm. this, uh, this sort of nasty looking, almost dead, turf-like thing is showing up all over in the Lincoln area. Oh, yeah. Starts in a circle, and then all of a sudden it's everywhere. Yeah, you what drive around any, any city in Nebraska right now, and you'll see these patches of grass just not greening up. You might think it's just dead in spots. No, these are warm season grasses, and particularly this one is uh, nimble will, a perennial warm season. Uh, another perennial warm season it could be would be zoysia grass. Um, nimble will is a tough one to control. If it's greened up, it's going to be a non-selective type of a product and you have to really make sure that you go way into the, your desirable lawn. If you, there are products that do selective control, that means the trial and tenacity um, is effective. And so if you are able to get the tenacity application and not on the fertilizer, the actual thing you would spray, um, multiple applications are re uh, required and you start once it's starting to green up. So the green up is going to be a little delayed. Normally we'd say late April. This year is probably going to be early to mid-May. When you see that green up happening, you want to get on it. What the mesotrion does is it bleaches it out so it goes white. It can't make sugar. Sugars are low from the winter and it just starves and dies. So if you see it start to green up, you have to make a second or a third application of the, of the mesotrion to thoroughly kill that nimble will and, uh, and then, have, then seed it so the other uh, grasses uh, can kind of fill that spot in. All right. Thank you, Bill. Kyle, uh, this is a viewer who lives in Omaha, and he says he finds more and more of these, he's calling them seed pods, in his yard. He doesn't, but he's not sure about mm -hmm. that. And he says if it's dry, they puff. And a puff up, yeah. <laughs> so those are not seed pods. Those are uh, those are mushrooms that are actually uh, have a symbiotic relationship with any trees that are in the yard. And so they're mycorrhizal mushrooms. They kind of extend the tree's root system. But those mushrooms, uh, those in particular, look like uh, dead man's feet mushrooms is one, <laughs> one of the common names. Another common name is the, uh, the dye maker's puff ball. And so they are not edible, so don't, don't even think about eating them. But you notice the, how, the, how they were black in the center. What you can do is you can actually make a great dye out of those. And so their, their scientific name actually, uh, is tinctorium mm. and taken after the dye. And you can actually make some pretty, uh, some pretty cool yarn dyes if you want to want to use those mushrooms. Or think about dead man's feet. Or think about dead man's feet, yes. Frostbite? <laughs> All righty <Yeah>. then. <laughs> Elizabeth, um, this is a uh, Bella Anna hydrangea, which was planted in Nebraska City in 2010. Wants to know when to cut that particular hydrangea back and how far. Um, with the Annabelle type hydrangeas, those are going to bloom on new wood, so you want to cut them all the way back to the ground. Um, I was walking around campus today and all the Annabelles have already been cut down here on campus uh, when I was walking around in the Arboretum, so maybe wait till after the snow this weekend, and then next week go ahead and cut them down. <laughs> exactly. Some have started to bud and that might yeah. have been a mistake. Well, send us announcements of all your cool things in the gardening world. We have a couple that are coming to us from Scott's Bluff. Uh, Saturday, Legacy of the Plains, and Wednesday the 18th at the Guadalupe Center. These are Master Gardener's public cleanup events. 
We'll see whether or not they actually get to do that based on the snow. We'll cross our fingers because it's always great to have help in, help in the gardens. All right, uh, Jody, we had a question about ticks in Nebraska and whether we in fact have deer ticks or other ticks and what should be done about that. What, what can you tell us about deer ticks? Well, what I've seen, and I do check um, the CDC website and our Nebraska Health Department, and we're not said to have a lot of populations that are naturally occurring and that a lot of the cases of Lyme disease have come from people traveling. But I have recently heard that there are some cases of, of Lyme disease and deer ticks in Nebraska, and I think it's important to know and to note that. So we want to get those reports. I know there's researchers on, on UNL campus that are interested in that, and we could go out and do a drag and try to, to find some of those. But regardless of the tick, all ticks in Nebraska can spread some pretty nasty diseases. So I recommend tick checks every time you're outside. Uh, there's not uh, like a safe time. I know that even a couple months ago there were um, seed ticks out. being uh, yeah, out when people were uh, gardening. All or, right, thank you, Jody. Or trimming, whatever they're doing, because they weren't gardening, sorry. <laughs> Bill, <Yeah. laughs> this is a North Platte viewer, okay. has bluegrass. He wants mm -hmm. to know whether we would recommend something like a Scott's four-step program for the lawn. It depends really on the age of the lawn. Uh, and the soil you have. If you have a real, if you have an old lawn um, that's been there for 20, 30, 40 years, those fertilizer applications are being stored in the soil and we have rich fertile soil as the, the turf has been pumping nutrients and organic matter into that soil. If you have a new lawn that's maybe, um, you know, a year or two old, you might need four or six applications to, to be enough to make that bluegrass look healthy. And so the general trend is as the lawn ages, especially on native soils that are a little heavier, higher silts and clays, you can actually start to reduce your fertility applications. Important timings, always remember though, uh, at least get two apps in, and that would be uh, in like early June, late May, and then also in September. And if your lawn is newer, you know, do some slow release applications in July. I know people will say, don't fertilize in July. If the lawn is yellow and not growing, it needs fertilizer. Your soil's not supplying it, and then you can get some growth. You just don't want a big surge of growth. So uh, at least uh, two is usually pretty good for a higher maintained lawn. But if it's a younger lawn, it might need four. It might even need six applications. So just be flexible. All right. Thank you, Bill. Kyle, this is a friend viewer who has sweet potatoes, full sun. Um, he said they had scab last year. Is there any way you can control scab in sweet potatoes that you're familiar with, or do we need to do a little research? On uh, that? I would probably need to do a little bit of a little, little bit of research on that, but really just general garden um, disease management, sanitation plays a big role. And so anytime you see any diseased leaves out there, try to try to take care of them, remove them from the garden. If you have any leaves that have dropped, remove those as well. And just really as clean of a, as, as clean of a garden bed as you can have, the better. All right, thank you, Kyle. Elizabeth, this is a Pierce viewer that has rhubarb. It's next to the garage. She says it's already up three inches or so. He's adding onto the garage, it's in the way. Can that be moved now? Are there any special things to do when we're digging and transplanting rhubarb? You know, right now, because they're going to have to move them, that would be the best time. You want to try to get as much as the root ball as possible, and you want to try to put it at the same depth that it is currently. We don't want to put it too deep or too shallow. The thing to keep in mind is we want to wait. We don't want to pick from it this year. We want to try to not pick from it next year because we want that crown to get a lot of energy into it. We don't want that to be stressed. We want to make sure that it has plenty of water going throughout the summer, again, if we're dry, um, and then just not pick from it for a few years years is going to be key with that one. Plenty of sun, that's what they like, is lots right. of sun. And, ma and make sure that the crown doesn't really get too soggy or rotty or any yep. of that and then stuff. Yep, and talking to Kyle. <laughs> talking, <laughs> talking to Kyle. Yeah, uh. technical term there. Soggy and rotty. So, soggy and rotty, that yeah. sounds like Kyle. Yeah. Sorry, Kyle. It's all right. Wow, you're just, it's I'm fruity, he's soggy, we're fine. <laughs>